The views and opinions of this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers. There is substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options, which you should carefully consider prior to trading. Well, as we take stock of the market action post-elections in the U.S. on Wednesday, we ended up having a fairly firm day in the grains and oil seeds with corn leading. Livestock futures found some green and plenty of fireworks in stocks and equities, a surging U.S. dollar and more. What do the results of the election mean for these markets moving forward? We're going to talk about that here today on the show. Joining us for market analysis, Mike Zuzalo with Global Commodity Analytics. Mike, great to have you join us here today. And uh, wondering, did you get a lot of sleep last night, checking the uh, returns and everything? No, but I wasn't expecting it, Jesse. It's just part of the job. I'm sure you're in the exact same situation. Uh, yeah. A lot of writing on the uh, on the policy and on this election uh, when it came to the agriculture sector. Absolutely. Well, in the famous words of Leonard Skinner, Tuesday's gone, gone with the wind. And luckily, we have some certainty. I, that's one of the big things I've told folks uh, here today is that we know who's going to be in the White House. And there's no drug out questions of who's winning and et cetera, et cetera. So now we turn our attention to what's ahead. And I, I think that's the big thing uh, we saw on Wednesday, some maybe some knee jerk reactions, but a lot of fireworks, as I mentioned, in stocks and equities. Maybe we should start there, Mike. Yeah, I mean... As a whole, and, and this is purely analytical, um, as a whole, when the election results were found out and the fact that the Republicans had flipped the Senate, which was as important to me as the presidential race because of the filibuster rule probably being voted away if the Democrats had won both the White House and the Senate, that would have really opened up a Pandora's box of fund-led volatility because we had a farm bill writing on this, we have a climate bill and policy writing on this, and we have a biofuel bill and policy writing on this. I can't express to you, Jesse, when I went to bed this morning, I, I really truly breathed a huge sigh of relief just from a standpoint of how I'm going to handle 2025 market analysis for commodities because I don't have to cross that Rubicon of Washington policy being the main instigator to the uncertainty. We know about President Trump and the tariffs. We've traded this Trump trade for several weeks. That Trump trade resumed after his victory and it was going to be about the currencies. And I think that's where your point is really well taken. And those currencies came in and did what they were supposed to do. My analysis, as you know, has been very currency heavy or very currency led. And it was very important to see the price reaction, not during the overnight trade, because that's mainly Asia, but really watch and see what happened in the day trade after the election, because that's Europe and the United States. One of the many things you're looking at with your analysis in terms of the equities, uh, U.S. dollar versus the Russian ruble. Let's take a look at that chart. And I know this is just a, a snapshot of many of the things that I'm sure we're going to be watching in the days ahead. But what are you seeing here as you compare these two currencies? You and I have looked a lot at the wedge formations, the triangle formations that the old timers would call the coil type formations where you have uh, lower highs and higher lows and it just keeps getting more narrow and narrow and narrow in terms of trading range and this weekly us dollar against the russian ruble chart shows one of those coils and it shows nearly perfectly at the point of that coil the expansion and, and the idea between a coil is that it's like a spring and it's getting stronger and stronger and more energy is being pushed into it so that at some point it has to unwind that energy. And I think that is really well represented in the weekly bar that we see here. The, the weekly bar, which most of this is, was done between the, before the election and, and in the late day of trading uh, on Wednesday, you notice this week's trade is as wide, if not wider than the last essentially 10 or 11 weeks of trade. And 
as you see this chart, you see the, the week's current week's trade is a red bar. That means the dollar is down against the Russian ruble. And so on Wednesday's trade, the question could be asked, why in the world was wheat higher when the dollar index was so strong? And if you've been listening and watching our program together, it would have made a lot more sense to you because the ruble was stronger and the euro was weaker. And that's about the best of both worlds when it comes to why the wheat market here in the States has not seen a bigger rally over the last two years. Uh, we've talked a lot about wheat needing to be the leader. Corn was the leader, though, on the day Wednesday. And I know Dee's corn got above that psychological kind of 420 level. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this corn market specifically. A lot of folks have been friendly corn here ahead of the election, wondering if uh, we could stay friendly corn moving forward. What's your analysis showing you in this corn market, Mike? Well, yeah, and I'm, I'm right there with them with only about 10 to 15% of my 24 corn sold at this point, banking a lot of corn at the expense of soybeans for what we've just got done harvesting. We've seen a tremendous improvement in cash basis. We've seen a tremendous outpouring of export sales. And, and I think this is where this cash market in the corn at the Gulf of Mexico now hitting 487, almost 490 a bushel. You can see that's one of the highest levels since June of last year. So before the crop was made, this begs the question of whether we're going to see a yield reduction on Friday's WASDE report for the corn and for the beans. And this takes us back to the major point of what we were just talking about in the post-election. I feel pretty strongly, Jesse, that with the President Trump victory and the Senate going to Republicans in Washington policy, other than Trump tariffs that, again, we've traded and traded and traded, we can talk about the supply demand fundamentals. We can talk about the potential Chinese stimulus. We can talk about the Federal Reserve policy. The fundamentals, I think, will be transferred into the prices much more clearly and cleanly because of this election result, instead of having to worry about climate, farm bill, and, and biofuel. But getting back to the corn, it was just, I think, the last four or five weeks, especially the last two weeks, with the, between the demand and the basis, and then the river levels coming back up, I think it was just waiting and waiting and waiting on the, our leader, our price leader, the wheat market. And I think this chart really shows it, especially when we contrast it with the soybeans. Well, and thinking about looking at that cash futures price of corn and then looking over at a weekly continuation chart as well, I mean, look at this for us and walk us through this. And, you know, obviously, it just feels like plenty of factors coming together here to support this corn market right now. And look what we're looking at again in orange this time. It's a coil formation. It's another yep. one of those wedges. And, it, and it's now we have broken higher in this wedge, almost again, perfectly on point. And so that gives me more confidence in the reliability of that chart indicator. And it suggests that, okay, we've got a major 52 week moving average sitting at just under 428. We've got last, excuse me, uh, this current month's high at about 434 and a quarter. So if we could clear 435 on a closing basis, look at where that would put us in terms of upside potential in this corn chart. It would put us back towards the highs back in the second quarter. And so we're talking about that 450, 460 potential, technically speaking. And, and I think this is really important to keep a laser focus on because we are getting those deferred futures back up close to 440, 450 in the May and the July corn. And so selling that carry is looking a lot more appealing at this point, especially with the basis also starting to come up as well. So corn, I'm on point for corn right now to really take it um, and, and run with it. And if we can break through above 435 on a weekly close, after we get the Chinese news, after the Fed, after the WASDE report, I'm going to suggest to clients, okay, get and subscribers, let's get really ready once we break another 10 or 20 cents higher to get on the bus and get, you know, add to that 10 to 15% sale in, most li in m the most likelihood. 
Mike Zuzalo with Global Commodity Analytics is our guest analyst here today on Market Talk. And I, I want to weave in soybeans here a little bit as well. We got a, a Nov 25 soy, Dees 25 corn chart to take a look at here. And, you know, with the election results, I, we saw it immediately in the overnight trade, of course. Huge sell-off in beans. A lot of the concerns about the uh, the tariff potential with China and demand, et cetera, but then, you know, we firmed up through the day session on Wednesday. I'm wondering as we move forward with this new administration, I mean, talk about this as we're thinking about next year, Mike. I mean, could we be potentially shifting more to corn acres versus soybeans? Could corn be buying some acres here? I mean, talk about this a little bit, looking out to some of these 25 contracts. You know, I really do have to think that, Jesse, because point number one in the short term is that the South American weather market for Brazil and their soybean crop, I believe, is now off the table until we get to January, February, and not so much for Argentina and the Pampas regions. Uh, and, and that's a crucial element for the corn and to a lesser degree, the wheat. But for Brazil and their soybeans with bigger acres, expectations of a 160 to 167 million metric ton uh, forecast for this new crop production as our early estimates are coming out. Um, we have a, an adequate, if not burdensome supply once again. And if we don't get a yield reduction on Friday, which I think we should, I think USDA would be very um, justified in cutting both corn and bean yields between now and January because of the physical uh, weight and, and moisture levels of the corn and soybeans that have been harvested in a large chunk of the central and eastern corn belt. Um, but if you talk about soybeans to me, this is one of the big reasons why they're still the leader to the downside. It's because of South American weather. And so once we get past the WASD report, you really do have to start thinking about bigger corn acres. And that's why this chart shows us we're heading in the new crop, NOV against DEES, we're heading now towards the major low in the Nov beans against the Dees corn, right as July corn, as I said, has crossed 450 and Dees corn closed a little over 445. So we're getting very close here at midweek to another 450 chance on Dees 25 futures. And I think we really, again, like the cash corn, do not want to squander an opportunity if this is one of the good breakouts uh, seasonally and one of the good breakouts that we get because of what I think was probably quite a bit of buying ahead and stockpiling of corn by Mexico and, and soybeans by China. I want to bring in the Fed and the WASD coming up here yet this week. It seems like a very pivotal week. Not only do we have elections, but then you got the Fed. They'll wrap up their two-day meeting Thursday, then the WASD on Friday. Just a lot of very pivotal items for the market to digest this week that could add some volatility. In terms of both of those, what's the biggest thing you're watching for? Could they both be volatile? Could one or the other be volatile? What's your take on what we have remaining for events here this week, Mike? I haven't crossed it off, but I would say the Federal Reserve is heavily overshadowed by what China does in terms of stimulus because the National People's Congress is meeting right now. They're expected to announce another stimulus package to resurrect domestic consumption through getting the bad property debt and bubble that is burst in their property market off to the side of the road um, like a wrecked car so that the market can move on with thinking that China is going to recover and come out of their deflationary hole. I think we might have talked about this last week, but we've got 24 straight months of deflation at the producer price level in China, and it's not getting any better right now. Unfortunately, it can later, but not right now. So I would say that China stimulus is extra important. And I'm inclined to think, Jesse, because President Trump won and he is an unknown variable, in one way, but the Chinese also realize that they're going to have to deal with him on an international trade basis. I would think they'd want to get their economy stimulated relatively quickly in case they've got to get into the trenches with the international trade between the United States and their, their own country. They can't afford to lose much more in terms of international trade, in my opinion. So I think the Chinese stimulus package is probably the most important piece of the puzzle all week long this week because it would shore up the idea in the funds mindset 
that the commodity demand is no longer falling, that it's at least hit a bottom. And I think that's really crucial. And this is where it goes back to the soybeans. We mm -hmm. don't want the soybeans to hit an August low and go through that. And, you know, we got pretty dangerously close to it in the Globex trade uh, in the overnight markets of the election. And I think this goes right in hand in glove with the hog market. The, the worse China goes economically, the more I'm nervous about the hogs and the soybeans. Let's go over and talk about livestock. How are they digesting the election results? Uh, we had cattle up through much of the day and hogs were lower and then hogs joined the party and everything finished in the green on Wednesday. Uh, what's your take on this protein sector? And I know we got one more chart to look at here, looking at the feeder corn ratio. So maybe we start on the cattle side, Mike. Yeah, this is where the, the consistency and the analysis and the confidence levels are pretty high right now for what I'm doing, Jesse, because the idea was, you know, last week, the equities are storming higher. And when they do, the cattle reacts. When the equities correct substantially, the cattle react pretty substantially. And this is where that Trump trade was being turned on and off a lot last week. Between the equities rallying so sharply after President Trump's victory, and my idea that the Washington policy is not going to hit the cattle market through the climate policy, beef cattle in particular. I mean, you talk methane, you might as well you know, insert beef cattle as a synonym. And so those two things I think really played out in the cattle market. Um, we could have probably done a lot better in the cattle market, but I think feeders actually held us back. And it's mainly because of that seven, eight cent rally we saw in the corn market. And you notice that that feeder corn ratio is now going through major support, you know, that's drawn all the way off of the 2022-2023 trend line. Um, and, then, and then you also notice that the resistance level has held again when it's tested. So I highlight the 2014-2015 market where we had a big push to the downside. The market recovered, it tested the resistance and then it was over by mid 2015. I'm not sure that that's going to be the case this this time around, but it's worth keeping track of. And so the feeders are playing defense at this stage of the game. And I don't see that changing much, uh, especially with the moisture replenishment uh, in, in the plain states. We may start to see more retention uh, as we go down the road here, but I still think that the prices are pretty rich. You mentioned the China impact on beans and hogs, that good old pork and bean trade. I've been concerned that hogs have maybe gotten a little overbought, but I guess some of that could depend on what happens here moving forward with that foreign policy with China and their stimulus and their economy and more. I mean, what's your thoughts on the hog market right now? Yeah, I agree. There's a gap in the Deese hogs that I showed 80-80 uh, from one of their big moves that started, uh, what, five, six, seven trading days ago. Um, that's probably a gap that the trade will want to fill relatively soon, if I had to guess. But we are coming into a positive seasonal after the Thanksgiving holiday, and it does look like we have a, a pork supply that's ample, it's relatively cheap. And uh, I do think that if we don't go up with the Chinese market leading, the hogs probably will have another slide after we get past that Christmas seasonal. So I, I'm very much where I was last week at this time, where I like being in the fourth quarter cattle hedges, I didn't get the fourth quarter hog hedges in place like I wanted to, um, but if I get a second opportunity, I sure will think hard about that and probably do it. And in the meantime, I think producers should stay very current in the hogs. Well, as we close it out here, Mike, I, I do want to ask as well, I'm very curious. We haven't really touched on stocks so much today, but obviously huge moves higher in the stocks but thinking about what we could see just moving forward with added volatility, et cetera. Uh, what's your thoughts on, on things here as we close out and just manage risk right now? There's probably an 80 to 85% likelihood that between now and the end of the month, I'll get some December E-mini S&P puts in place that we are putting a lot of fat in the equities markets. The other big thing to watch, Jesse, is as we talked about last week, I think the two biggest undervalued commodities for me is wheat and crude oil, WTI crude. Now this Trump victory, what does crude oil do? Does it go down another leg because of drill baby drill mindset? And if not, did we price this drill baby drill mindset in already and the crude oil is near a major low? And I think 10 days from now, we should have a pretty good idea on that. 
All right. Folks want to check out your analysis, have a conversation, all those things as we navigate this market picture moving forward. I know you got a lot of great information online. It's a great place to start. Where can folks get more, Mike? Yeah, globalcomresearch.com is the place to go. And as you say, there's a lot of geopolitics and geoeconomics that I look at that really drives into the agriculture space. And, and part of that goes back to the President Trump's picks in agriculture, his USDA guy, his international trade guy. And I've been reading the book by Robert Lighthizer about tariffs and the dollar, and it's got some good insights in it. I'd be happy to share if you sign up for a trial. Mike Zuzalo with Global Commodity Analytics. Always good to talk with you, sir. Thanks for joining us to talk markets post-election day. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Jesse. Appreciate you having me. Make sure to subscribe to the Market Talk YouTube channel. There, you can watch our latest interviews with the top market analysts in the country, find bonus content, and much more. Just go to youtube.com slash market talk egg and hit the subscribe button, or you can search for Market Talk Egg on YouTube.